All right, here we go. Hey, welcome back to the Unbelievable Podcast. I am BJ Rydell, back here with my guy, Drew Mahold. And today, the Minnesota Vikings are 4-2, uh, coming off a big victory over the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, everything seems to be um, all right in Minnesota. Um, everyone seems to be happy. Well, most people are happy. There's always going to be some people that find a reason to be you know, unhappy, I suppose. But um, not us here at the Unbelievable Podcast, where I think uh, – I, you're happy, right? I'm not, I don't want to. I mean, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm happy. Um, so, uh, game plan today, uh, twin season is obviously over, uh, so it's straight football today. Uh, we t- we considered talking about the Wild a little bit, but um, after a 1-4 and four start, uh, they got their first win today against Ottawa, which is not much to talk about. So, uh, <laughs> we will prolong talking about the Wild for a little bit here at least, uh, and uh, kind of see where, where that goes eventually. But for now, uh, sticking straight to football. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a great week to talk only about football, too, um, with the Vikings coming off a big win. So uh, we will do our standard recap of the game, kind of see where that takes us. Uh, in the middle of the show, we'll do the skull scale, as we typically do. Uh, we'll read off a couple of responses, uh, talk about where our optimism stands, uh, and uh, – kind of go from there and then we will finish up assuming we have time towards the end of the show we will finish up uh with some around the league action uh it's kind of a fun week uh around the league so Mm -hmm. we can uh we'll talk a little bit about that stuff if we have time so that's the game plan for today uh so let's jump right into it here um i don't know why i always feel compelled to give you guys a quick recap of what happened in the game because i know you all watch the game but um (laughs) Vikings win 38 to 20. Uh, Kirk Cousins has arguably his best game uh, with the Vikings. Uh, another home win. So your theory on uh, the Vikings playing at home holds true, at least for another week. Uh, Stephon Diggs comes up with three touchdowns. Uh, Might have actually had potential to have four. Um, and uh, Delvin Cook gets another touchdown. He remains among the league leaders in that category. Adam Thielen continues his touchdown streak. Uh, the offense looked f- fantastic in general. Uh, defense, for the most part, with the exception of a little bit of a lapse in during the third quarter, was also outstanding. So uh, it's kind of fi- it, it's it's hard, but also not too hard to find a place to start with this game um, because there were so many you know great mm-hmm. performances as a whole. But I think that given that we give Kirk Cousins a hard time when he plays poorly, uh, I think the only place to start here is with Kirk Cousins' performance. Yeah. Uh- Made all the throws he needed to. I think, you know, I think I saw it was either, I think it was, well, he finished with like a 93 PFF grade, which whatever you want to feel about PFF, uh, they're usually pretty hard on Kirk, it seems like. Um, So when he gets that kind of a grade, you know it's meaningful. Um, But for as good as the deep throws were and as many shots he took deep, which was great to see, I think he took... He had 12 attempts longer than 15 yards past the line of scrimmage. Um, but the, the third and 13 on the first drive is what is the thrill that I love the best. Uh, I think he hit Thielen like over the middle, kind of Thielen made a sliding catch on a third and 13 with, um, you know, it, it, I think he kind of threw Thielen open, so to speak, in between a couple guys in the secondary. Um, that's a big time throw. You know, those third and long plays where a lot of times you've seen him check down on a slant or a drag or a, a you know, a check down to running back for five yards and punt. Uh, that time, Kirk, whatever he saw from Thielen or saw from the Eagles coverage, whatever it was, anticipated it and made the right throw. It was an absolute strike down the middle. That's the type of stuff that, you know, I'd like to see more of. And um, over time, and obviously you're playing against the Eagles secondary, which may or may not be as good as the Hamlin Pipers or something like that. But point being, <laughs> Kirk, Kirk, Kirk made the throw that was – that was necessary there kind of carried out the rest of the game and uh, took advantage of the mistakes that Eagles secondary made, which were a lot. He definitely did that. Um, So first and foremost, I just want to say that uh, you're supposed to take advantage of weaknesses, right? Uh, The most uh, obvious criticism of Kirk Cousins this week is that he played well against a bad secondary. Well, well, the flip side of that would just be, would you have preferred that he played poorly against the bad secondary? Because that's yeah. like a worst case scenario. So let's just start, let's just get that out of the way right away. Uh, he took advantage of some not so great cornerbacks, uh, arguably the two best cornerbacks on the Philadelphia Eagles roster, Jalen Mills and Ronald Darby were not playing. So uh, 
it, Kurt took advantage of that situation. That's all I have to say on that front. I, I don't care about the bad second. This is, these are NFL players. I, I, I don't care. I don't care if it's Craig James. I don't care if it's Jalen Ramsey. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, all these guys have the potential to play well, especially at the cornerback position where you're also affected by the pass rush, which was neutralized for the most part by the yes, Vikings offensive line. Point. So uh, the fact that the Vikings were able to kind of take advantage of not only the biggest weakness on Philadelphia, but in addition to that, uh, kind of neutralize their what at least what we thought going into this week would be uh, their strongest asset on defense, being their pass rush. Um, that was extremely impressive. Now, uh, not only did the Vikings' offensive line, you know, as a complete unit, there there is something to say about Pat Elfline's performance, which was not awesome, but we can get to that later. Uh, Kirk took advantage of that offensive line playing well. Um, which leads me to believe that a lot of Kirk playing well uh, is highly dependent on the game plan. And it, I, I, started, I started thinking about this more and more. Uh, the way that they draw it up throughout the week, uh, I think that you have to give either A, more credit, or B, uh, the flip side of that, take, take away from – I can't even – why can't I think of the opposite? But you know what I'm saying. Um uh, the, my point being here is that I think the game plan really impacts Kirk Cousins' performance on a week-to-week basis because they came in, they came out with a great game plan this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, the play action was flying, and Kirk was hitting those play action passes. Um, and for what it's worth, the run game was not that it successful It wasn't. Either. It really I mean, wasn't. It had a few big plays here and there. Madison had a big run. I think Cook had a couple 10, 15-yard gains. But outside yeah. of that, they were smothered for the most part. And it, I think we know by now analytics will tell you that teams fall for play action to some degree every single time yeah and whether the run's working whether it's not whether your running back is a stud whether he's not like it teams fall for it and it works the concepts work better and i know stefanski and kubiak are both very pro play action um sure. historically and it seems like that's kind of more and more working its way into vikings offense i think the only difference now at, that needs to be worked out is you know how much emphasis is this you know, like what's the run pass ratio in terms of emphasis, right? Because I feel I feel like Stefanski kind of his background and what he's done with the pat in the past with the Vikings has been a lot of pass heavy stuff. Right. Um, West Coast offense, you know, and Zimmer obviously has preached over and over run the ball, uh, possession game, like let the defense win the game, that type of stuff, which is very old school. It seems like Kubiak was maybe brought in to to bridge that gap a little bit, kind of find, find a some happy medium there. Yeah. Yeah, and so, I mean, right now we've got, you know, week one against the Falcons was extremely Zimmer, like, prototypical win. This was kind of the opposite at the end. They're this both wins. This is a wins. John Filippo type of game. Yes, yes. So you, you, you wonder what's going to – I mean, obviously it's prettier to watch the pass happy and, and it's more fun and more explosive. Um, we'll see what happens moving forward, but I think that's something to monitor is that it seems like Kirk is more comfortable playing with the pass happy, you know, uh, throw the ball down the field type of offense versus giving it to Dalvin and then not really getting Kurt. It seems like Kurt can't really get into a rhythm with that kind of old school uh, approach that Zimmer likes. Well, I think a lot of quarterbacks just, you know, throughout history have talked about how important it is to get into a rhythm earlier in the early in the game. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's certainly some truth to that, uh, regardless of what Cousins wants to say about that. But uh, I, I think that getting him going early um, – and then in addition to, and I think this is very important because I think this makes the Vikings a much better mid-season team than an early season team, just simply the threat of the run, right? Uh, the fact that the Vikings have run ran the ball as effectively as any team in the NFL uh, over the previous five weeks just gives the Vikings more opportunities to effectively use play action first and foremost. Uh, the fact that even when the Vikings had gotten up to you know a couple score lead, uh, they continued to throw, which I, I really liked, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Eagles had to be thinking, okay, they're going to run the ball now because this is what they've always done, right? The Vikings get out to a good lead, uh, and they try to milk the clock. Well, this week that didn't happen. So, so I just think that the simple threat of having a good rushing attack, um, now that they have put it on film for five, you know, Cook has had, what, four very strong weeks and one week which was – kind of mediocre and then this week which I would consider to be somewhere in between mediocre and very good I mean he scored uh Madison kind of Madison actually led the team in rushing by the way Mm -hmm. Uh, 
just the threat of the run as a whole, I think, will continue to have an impact on how the Vikings play the rest of this year just because you have to account for Dalvin Cook at this point. And really, you have to account for Madison, too. Uh, so I think that's an important factor moving forward. Uh, Cousins was an extremely, extremely good play-action passer, too. Uh, mm-hmm. He always has been, um, and it's, you know, we, obviously we saw it yesterday. He's always been very comfortable, you know, obviously the play fake looking back, and it seems like for whatever reason he just clicks a lot. It clicks for him a lot better, you know, off of those concepts versus a right. quick drop back, quick, uh, you know, the hot read stuff, whatever you may want to call it. Uh, he seems to process things a lot better and a lot smoother through play action. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm all for a lot more of that from Stefanski and Kubiak moving forward. Just kind of seems, again, the difference or the, the thing to watch is going to be the Zimmer old school philosophy versus like the, I guess if you want to call it new school, but the Stefanski kind of pass happy type of, of philosophy there. Uh, we'll see how that how that works. It seemed like last year John DeFilippo was sort of given the keys to the offense. Like here's what you can just take it and run with it. Yep. And over time, Zimmer was like, okay, I, I need to run the ball a bit more. And now we're kind of at a point where it seems like we kind of have noticed that Kirk performs better when he's allowed to kind of launch the ball. So there's there's going to be some give and take there between Zimmer and Stefanski and company to figure out the identity of the offense. If there is one, maybe they just kind of mix it up and, and you know, worry about it each, uh, each week and, and on a week-to-week basis. But uh, definitely something to monitor. So this is now back-to-back performances from Kirk Cousins, which uh, last week was very good. Uh, if not better than that. But I think that very good will cover just about every Vikings fan's opinion. This week was outstanding. Um, just to give you an idea of how much two weeks has changed the kind of the statistical perception of Kirk Cousins. So I'm not talking about, you know, pro football focus or advanced analytics yeah. or anything like that, but basic statistics. Uh, Cousins currently now after – so now standing at 4-2 and two after six weeks, uh, he has the – he's tied for third in average yards per attempt at 8.9. Uh, he's tied with Dak Prescott, the two guys in front of him, Russell Wilson and Patrick Mahomes. His quarterback rating, which this surprised me. Uh, this is not QBR, by the way. This is quarterback this rating. This is passer rating, right? Yeah, passer rating. Uh, stands at – he's third behind Russell Wilson and Patrick Mahomes at 108.4. Uh, his completion percentage – Sitting at 69.7, I believe he stands at 6th in that category. Um, And his touchdowns to interception ratio at 9-3 to uh, is uh, basically about as good as any ratio in the NFL if you're excluding Russell Wilson and Patrick Mahomes. (laughs) So just to give you an idea of how quickly things can change, I mean, two weeks ago the Vikings were, I believe, the number 31 ranked passing offense. Uh, and all of a sudden, Kirk Cousins is averaging 225 yards per game. That's how quickly this thing has shifted. Uh, now has he played against a suspect sec- secondary in Philadelphia and a kind of a dumpster fire in the New York Giants to kind of inflate those stats? Sure, uh, I'll take that argument. But again, I just I, I have to emphasize, emphasize this every time. Like, you have to play well against those teams. Like, those are number inflator games, sure. But if you don't do it, like, it's – a really, really bad sign. Like, this is a good sign for Kirk Cousins. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know if this is going to continue. I, I certainly expect that we're going to get, uh, you know, Cousins, a Cousins egg at some point. But right now, things are moving really well. I think the game plan is, I, again, I'm going to keep going back to the game plan because I think this is, I, I really think this is an important point. The fact that if you draw up a perfect game plan for Kirk Cousins and then you get a jump early on in the game, uh, and allow him to kind of sit back and just relax um, and not get in his own head and thinking, okay, we're down by two scores early. I need to bring us back. I like him a lot more as a quarterback. Uh, it's a it's a lot easier to say this is the guy that I signed up for. The guy that showed up against Philadelphia this week is the guy that I would pay $84 million mm-hmm. to. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you continue to get this t- – not it doesn't even need to be this type of performance, but uh, – a very strong performance that has that mirrors this to a degree, you know, hitting the deep shots downfield when they're open. I believe he was three for four on deep completions. Um, he hit the, the fade route to Adam Thielen in the corner of the end zone, which is the beauty of a route by Thielen, but he dropped it right in the basket there. Uh, every throw, with the exception of, I believe, one, was made. Well, and I think the it, one throw that I 
I you know can point to is the the almost touchdown to Thielen that right. Um, was floated, floated just a little bit, kind of keenumed it a little bit, and if it was kind of thrown with a little bit more on a rope, that's a touchdown. But that's again, that's nitpicking after the way he played throughout the whole game. I mean, those right. both of those deep ones to Diggs were right on the money. The touchdown on the back of the ends on the Diggs was also right on the money, where only he could make that catch. Like the accuracy for the most part has not been the criticism of Kirk. It's right. just been the decision making. It's been um, the like you know the decisions in the pocket fumbling in the pocket uh that type of thing um and when the pass protection holds up like it did yesterday um against a really good front four and against a team with a shoddy secondary you know he's he's going to light them up uh especially with Diggs and Thielen doing what they do on the outside the fumbling really is the biggest concern that I have and um I've kind of I'm willing to sort of give him a little less criticism for the fumbles. Uh, I'm not going to completely shy away from that because he's ridiculous with his fumbles. Uh, but there are a lot of quarterbacks who fumble, by the way. I've just been noticing this more and more, uh, specifically but just by watching red zone more often. There are a lot of quarterbacks throughout the league that have a yeah. fumbling problem when someone hits them in the blind side. I mean, Patrick Mahomes That's, this is a why, dead man walking. This is why left yesterday. tackle is so valuable. I right. mean, or I guess, well, yeah, left tackles. There's no lefties in the NFL at quarterback as of now that are starting. But um, that's going to change with Tua uh, soon. But point being, left tackle is pretty important for that reason. Uh, and for what it's worth, Rashad Hill was excellent. Yeah. Uh, he stepped in. He's done this. This is now the second time in his career where he stepped into a situation where uh, all hell could have broken loose. Yes. Um, and he showed up. And I don't believe he allowed a sack, right? If I have that right. Maybe, I think the only one that could have been on him was actually on Pat Alfline, So. And Brian O'Neill still hasn't allowed a sack. Uh, in his career, so he's right. allowed like seven pressures total in his career, right. which is just dumb. And I think we'll probably be talking more about him later on here. Uh, just to finish up with Kirk Cousins, I mean, uh, as as a whole, uh, this is this is the guy that you need to find a way to get week in and week out. Now, is there a perfect answer to that yet? I I don't think so. Well, I should say, will there ever be a perfect answer to that question of getting this guy every week? Probably not. Um, do would it be nice to see him do this against a a more studly defense before we really start raining praise on Kirk? Uh, that's probably fair. I, I'm, well, I'm okay we'll, we'll with get, that. I think we'll get that chance to see that next week because I think Detroit. I mean, it is depending on, the road on what too. depending on what line is good. Right, depending on what the uh, they put on display tonight, Monday night against the Packers. But right. uh, you know, so far their defenses look pretty solid all across the board. I think. Uh, all three levels. So we'll see what kind of performance Kirk can provide next week. But as of now, you know, it, it's definitely a very positive sign to see him just light up, confidently light up two defenses in a row that you sh- kind of should light up. Um, and kind of also, it's even more of a positive to see them open up the playbook a little bit, let him throw down the field. And like you said about the game plan, like kind of get him comfortable early and often uh, and let him get his receivers in, in the game. Um, and let him whip it down the field where, Thielen and Diggs and company can kind of make plays against uh, cornerbacks, which 99% of the time, that's going to be a matchup you like. I hope uh, I hope a lion says something about Kirk Cousins this week. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, we talked a little bit about it in the last show. Like, are we buying into this idea that, you know, that he can flip a switch and become a different guy? Well, this is two weeks in a row now where he's been openly criticized by someone – uh, let's say close to him, I think is probably the, the best encompassing term there just because he played with Zach Brown when he was in Washington. Like that's a guy that he knows, a guy mm-hmm. that uh, you'd think would probably be a little bit more, uh, <laughs> maybe more, de- not necessarily more defensive of him, but at least a little bit more, a little kinder, would mince his words a bit more. Um, I like this Kirk Cousins. I like this guy that has, uh, that plays with a chip on his shoulder, that has a little bit more confidence, has a little bit more edge to him. You kind of saw it in his press conference too, uh, just the way he spoke. Um, the denim jacket, by the way. <laughs> Fire. Fire. Kirk Cousins gets an overall an A+. Plus. The, really, the only blemish on his uh, resume this week was the interception, which was on Stephon Diggs. So, uh, and I don't think there's any arguing that. If you want to argue no. that with me, um, you can try. But uh, I, I but, did see there was a uh, – I can't remember his name. There was a Packer media person that clearly wasn't watching the game. Oh, yeah. I saw it. I saw I it. Saw that, that was the former GM, uh, Andrew Brandt, right? Okay, yeah, that's who it was. Yeah. Was somebody that – Clearly, wasn't actually watching the game. Was following on uh, game like cast a, a, or whatever. A game, yeah, some sort of tracker that way, and said, "Oh, he misses digs deep, and then throws an interception to play after." There's Kirk Cousins. It's like, 
mean, okay. Like he's he, normally a ball, rational guy too on Twitter. Could not have been a more perfect, uh, perfect pass. You know, on the sideline creates a play out of out of nothing on third down to get the first down. Diggs it had to had be to. Sandejo too, right? It had to be Sandejo. But nevertheless, uh, the Vikings obviously were able to recover from that. Uh, let's talk about Stephon Diggs now. Um, the first, the initial question thing, the initial question that I have for you is: Does this, does this end any sort of trade rumors, un, uh, unhappiness, discomfort, uh, you know, whatever about Stephon Diggs' role in Minnesota? Uh, does this does this end that? Are we done with that? Is it over? Yeah, this that's done. Uh, I I mean I don't I he was never getting traded in the first place. And I think we can all. I don't I don't think, I don't think it took this type of performance to the end that. It was just kind of. But it shuts up the national media, right? Like the, yeah, they, now they can point well, to yeah, we can whole... point to facts and be like, are you crazy? He just got ten targets or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. He's a big factor in the offense. They clearly need him. Etc. The. the uh, yeah, the media narrative does not need to be overblown anymore like it has been, I think, because I think the old, the, the issue has always been about the philosophy. And, and I think I think that my opinion from what I uh, can gather is that the difference, the differing opinions was about the Zimmer run first style of offense versus like, you know, Diggs is of the mindset like, well, me and myself and Adam are two of the top 15 receivers or better in the NFL why are we, you know, wasting so many snaps for running the ball and, and chewing clock when there's so many more, ex- there's so much more expected value by throwing the ball to one of us. So, uh, right. and that obviously has changed the last couple of weeks, uh, getting the ball to the playmakers. So I think things should be good as long as, you know, the, the passing game becomes more of an emphasis throughout the rest of the season there. I don't really see any more issues going on, but I think it's, it's, you know, it was two hundred thousand dollars or whatever it was for Diggs to send that message, but I think it's probably something that everybody's going to be welcome for at some point down the stretch here. I, I'm I'm okay with that, honestly. Like I'm looking back, I look back at that. Um, I didn't, I didn't really put too much stock in that whole blow up by Stefan. Was it even a blow up? Whatever, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I didn't put too much stock in that. I, I thought it was. An out of character move by a guy who is probably still maturing to a degree. Uh, that's kind of what I took took away from that, um, and I I don't think he'll ever do it again. Um, and I don't think that that I don't think that he's a problem. Like he's not a he. I don't think he's a diva. I think that he is someone who has a difficult time controlling his passion for. Uh, not just the game, but just in general. Like he's just a very passionate person. Um, it's it's been like that. You know, when we started doing about the labor, we were talking about Stefan Diggs getting stupid penalties. Do you remember this? Mm-hmm. Where he would mm-hmm. get the stupid penalties for some sort of you know excessive His emotional reaction. Yeah, 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 just something like that. Um, I tie Stefan Diggs's outburst to that more than I tie it to. You know the people that want to say it's Antonio Brown light type of thing. It's just not like that with him. He's just not that type of person. I think it was an out of character thing, and I think that this quickly shuts that down. Um, He's team first, I think. More it just this kind of really this kind of this, ca- this kind of this kind of really destroyed that reputation. But I definitely think he's still a team first guy. Uh, you know, overall. But um, yeah, it's di- yeah. I'm not worried about Diggs at all. We can, right. we can shut that question down. Good. I'm, I'm certainly with you on that. So he comes up with seven receptions on 11 targets for 167 yards, a career-high three touchdowns. Uh, I saw this statistic. I'm sure a lot of you guys did as well. 250-plus yard touchdowns, first Vikings wide receiver to do that since Randy Moss. Randy in, Moss. In 2000. So uh, outstanding performance from Stephon Diggs. You also get a – uh, very strong performance from Adam Thielen, uh, like we touched on a little bit before. He could have easily had two touchdowns and uh, about 85 yards. He ends up with 657 and one. Uh, I think you got two happy campers there. Kyle Rudolph finally gets involved, although I am very tired of them throwing screens to Kyle Rudolph. I don't like. I fundamentally do not understand that. Like, is there any? Is like, do you see? Uh, do you understand any rhyme or reason to throwing these? Screen passes to Kyle Rudolph when one, you've got Irv Smith Jr. on your on your team, 
who he clearly like. I like Kyle Rudolph a lot. He's one of my favorite people that have come through this organization since I started following the Vikings. But like, let's just be honest here. Like, who would you ra- like? Who is gonna make? Who's gonna break a tackle or miss a tackle? More, like, who is more likely to do that? Kyle Rudolph or Irv Smith? Like, what's the rationale behind it? Honest, I, honestly, like, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't know. You're asking the wrong person. Um, if there's the only theory there, I have is that the defense looks at the personnel and is like, well, they're definitely not running a tight end screen. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's the best possible answer for that too because I, like there's just no rhyme or reason for it. So um, that is annoying to me. But I do like seeing Kyle Rudolph involved. He actually had three catches uh, this week, which is nice. So uh, it's got to be a season high, right? <laughs> that is definitely a season high. I mean, he's, I don't think he's had more than one this year. Um, uh, you've also got Laquan Treadwell getting involved, which was hilarious. I think every was, I think yeah, everyone that was, left. That was maybe the best throw of the day. Uh, it was in terms of just pure accuracy and and difficulty, and then the catch was also a phenomenal. I was going to say, do we great. give Treadwell some credit for that? Because like he caught the where he caught that ball, it was out of bounds. Like his feet oh, yeah. were still in bounds, but his hands were over that oh, line. Well, out, well out of bounds. Oh, right. Yeah. So I got You got to. You got to give a tip of the cap to Treadwell on that one. I mean. You know that he sees all the criticism he's getting. You know that right. no one wa- – like, he knows that no one <laughs> no one thought that he'd be back or wanted him back. So, uh, I give him a tip of the cap for that catch. Uh, I thought that was nice. And BZ Johnson also had a catch as well. So, uh, all the targets the for way, the Vikings got involved. On the digs, one of the Diggs touchdowns, um, the I think this is the second one. Diggs and BC were both running – essentially both running uh, nine routes on some play action – uh, concept that all the the entire Eagles defense fell for, and there was absolutely no safety help over the top. BC had beat his man by about five to seven yards. Diggs obviously had beaten his by a few yards. Like Kirk had his pick essentially of you know which guy to go one, to. They're both going to score. There was a play like that with Adam Thielen as well. Uh, I didn't notice the one you're speaking about, but I remember that's like, the one. That's the one where Diggs scored on the second yeah, touchdown. Right for BC was open. I'm sure there was with Thielen because he's just always open, but. How about uh, how about that? Uh, there was also the the one play that kind of looking back at the the film of it, uh, I believe it was the second touchdown where he he quite literally like there was no press coverage like I don't think there I don't think the cornerback ever touched him yeah. he quite literally just ran like he yeah was, oh, oh, well, the, uh, on the second one the corner appeared to be acting as if he was in zone like a flatter zone yeah coverage and there's going to be it's like. Is as if he was playing cover two, but there was no safety up top. I, right. It, but one thing I wanted to note here, I saw this stat yesterday, and I just found it on my phone. So I'm going to share it now, uh, and that's why I hadn't shared it before. Uh, a lot of the frustration last year that I had with uh, DeFilippo and you know the Diggs production was how Diggs was being used so much for jet sweeps or like underneath stuff, screens, what have you. Uh, last year, he ranked 83rd in average depth of target in the league at 8.9 yards. This year, um, before the Monday night game, he is at 16.1 average yards depth of target. Uh, that's sixth most in the NFL. So using him as a vertical threat more and more, where like he that. obviously – not that he's not good at like catching screen passes and making people miss, but there's a lot of his talent. You know, He's also very, very um, – good at going down the field um whether it's beating people on routes down the field or whether it's one-on-one contested catches he's also very very effective there as well he wasn't used like that very much last year and obviously that's changed so far uh this year and the reason for that is the way he was used against the eagles and we did see the gadget play by the way uh, that double reverse i was oh, i wanted to throw it so bad that... <laughs> dude how funny was that i, I said that uh I hope some of you remember his Maryland days uh, because I immediately thought back to when he was at Maryland. And uh, if you haven't already, make go just go look back at the the tape for Stephon Diggs when he was able to be on the field for Maryland because that's quite literally what Maryland's offense was. It was revolving almost exclusively around getting Stephon Diggs the ball. And there was a bunch of plays like that where he was just, just just trying to find ways to juke guys out of their shoot, like very creative. Like 
he was he had the ball stretched all the way out like that yeah. sh- could have been a fumble two or three that's, times I mean, but that, that's how LaShawn McCoy carries the ball at all times for what this it's was worth. this might have been worse than LaShawn McCoy honestly <laughs> but that was uh that was fun so the the, the the Vikings are still getting him involved uh in that way as well but I think that you know you talked about that specifically during the preseason it's nice to see um that those deep targets coming to fruition so um, as a transition to that I mean part of the reason why we are able to get these deep shots is because of the way the offensive line plays. Um, We haven't talked too much about them on the show because they haven't really given us much of a reason to. Uh, We touched on Rashad Hill, who had a strong performance. Um, I think it's time that we we talk uh, a little bit about Brian O'Neill because, as Mm -hmm. you mentioned before, um, this is a guy who has not allowed a sack in the NFL. Um, Let's also keep in mind this is a guy that came in as a second-round pick out of Pittsburgh. Uh, He looked like a tight end when he was coming into the NFL and he was getting criticism from every smart person I know about his uh, ability to step in right away and play effective football. Uh, He has done literally just that. Um, So my question here is with Riley reef out, is this, or should we consider moving Brian O'Neill to the left side at some point here? No, I mean, no, I don't think so. On I the mean, flip side to that, you obviously have the opportunity to stick with him on the right side and, you know, fortify, which is, you know. I think you fortify the, the right tackle spot there. Um, you just, it, it's, it, I don't know. I, again, I'm no offensive line guru by, any, by right. any means, but it seems like when you mess, when you get guys that are get comfortable in one spot, I just keep thinking of Mike Rembers. Uh, you get guys that are comfortable in one spot. Yeah. And you, and you start mo- shuffling them around. It's one thing if they're, you know, a backup guy who, has experience all over the place when you draft him or bring him in as a rookie right. and you can kind of plug and play him everywhere as a depth piece. That's one thing. But O'Neill's been a starter since what was it week two last year, maybe even going into the season last year. Um, and he's been rock solid at that spot all, the whole time. Obviously only allowed, I think seven pressures his entire career. He's winning at his pass block win rate is I think top 10 in the NFL. Uh, you have to, you have to keep him there, I think. And uh, especially the way Rashad Hill played, and when you get that type of performance, all the Bradbury as well at center, and you neutralize that front four in Philly. Yep. Fletcher I think Cox, keep, too, by yeah, the way. You, you just keep things the way they are. Brandon Graham, I believe, is who O'Neill went up with most of the time, uh, or up against the, most of the time in that game. And we talked very highly of Brandon Graham before right. the game, and he was effectively a non factor in that game. So let me rephrase then. Uh, next offseason, uh, would you consider transitioning Brian O'Neill? Or is this. It, it, I think it has to be a unique situation. If there's so you th- you would you think a, that it's better to keep him long term at right tackle as opposed yeah. to fortifying yeah. what we would That's consider what I would do. to be. I'd keep him there, because, unless it's a unique situation where there's a a right tackle or a, a specialized right tackle that you know is taking a humongous discount to come to Minnesota or something along those lines. And the best way to get in here would be to move him over there, something like that. Then I think you entertain it, but. O'Neal's a stud at right tackle. That's what we know, and I think that's what we should. That's what the Vikings should uh, move, move forward with. I, I, t- I tend to agree, um, although I, I do, I do believe I still, you know, I, I still think that left tackle is is a bit of an issue. It, it, it leaves me. Well, and, and I understand the you know left tackle is just carries more importance because right. of what you said earlier about the blind side and how especially with quarterbacks like Kirk who fumble often, like yeah. it's, it's important to shore that up. So you're not getting, uh, you know, a TJ Clemmings play here and there where you're not, you're hardly making contact. And then the quarterback has no idea guys coming and you can't really blame the quarterback in those situations when the ball gets on the ground. Uh, but I just, when you have that position shored up the way it is though, Neil, I really think you got to stick him there. And you can then kind of focus more of your resources or more of your time and energy in finding a consistent left tackle when you know one side is already kind of figured out. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with you there. Uh, I do think that it's a question that at some point it, it will be asked by, you know, uh, by a reporter, and this is something that will be entertained in the future, I think, just simply because you, it, it, it's like getting a promotion, basically. Based it, like going from the right side to the left side, um, it's not necessarily something that you see, you know, a ton across the league. But left tackle is, if you're Brian O'Neill, 
um, and you believe you can play left tackle, you'd rather play it because there's simply more money. There's there's more money there. This is true. Um, so uh, this it's just something to entertain. Uh, I'm with you on that for now, and I think most of our listeners would be would agree with you there. You don't you know don't try to fix something that's not broke. So uh, the interior of the offensive line, uh, Bradbury had a solid performance. Uh, he wasn't a problem this week, which is that's good. It seems like he's growing and. Uh, when you've got, I believe it was Timmy Jernigan, Jernigan was in there, and then you got Fletcher Cox as well. Um, you got two guys that are, uh, I would consider to be at least, at the very least, above average in Timmy Jernigan's case, and uh, elite Fletcher in Cox Fletcher Cox's case. Yeah, uh, and you're able to basically keep them, uh, for the most part, neutralized. I mean, uh, they didn't get a sack, so there's that. Uh, the only sack coming from our guy Brandon Graham, by the way. Uh, Pat Elfline, though, that he that was the the one sack that came. It was a uh, it was like a stunt. It, it was it was it was something. Uh, it was not good. It was very. It was not good at all. Um, he didn't it, touch anybody, as far as I remember. It was exactly, and half the battle for an offensive lineman is just getting in front of guys, and Pat Elfline is not doing that too well. Um, what? It, where is your concern level uh, with Pat Elfline? It, it, it it's I'm concerned, but I'm also at the same time like they you know what they say about left guard being like the least valuable spot right. on the entire offense. So to me, it's it's a concern. But like if you're gonna have a weak link, so to speak, uh, I suppose that's kind of the spot to have it. So right. I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm just very encouraged by Rashad Hill stepping in there and doing well. Obviously O'Neal being a stud still, and Bradbury having the performance that he's he had against I think the toughest competition he's played in his career. And he easily had the best game of his career uh, to this point. So that's all very encouraging. It seems like he's kind of finding his stride. I'm not as worried about offline as, um, you know, I, I would be more, I'd be more worried about it if other pieces were not kind of li- uh, living up to the expectations, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think that's, you know, that's a fair point. Uh, you, you're going to have to, you're going to have a weak, weak link somewhere. Uh, and I think you're, I think that's a, that's a great point that if, if you're going to pick somewhere, anywhere or on your offense or defense to have a weak link, I think left guard is probably the right spot to have it. Um, and th- just the simple fact that uh, you can remain optimistic about Pat Elfline, uh, you know, uh, growing, um, getting back to form. He just simply hasn't been the same guy since he got, the, since he was injured. Um, he might have that injury might have ruined his career. If we, we might look back and say that that injury mm-hmm. um, really dampened kind of a, a guy that had the opportunity to be uh, a very very good guard in the NFL or maybe possibly even a good center. Um, he's in a tough spot. Uh, hopefully he will rebound. Uh, like we said, you got great performances out of O'Neal, Bradbury, uh, and Rashad Hill stepping in, and Hunter Dozier was not a liability. So um, uh, as a whole, that front five was very solid against. Uh, you know, like you said, probably one of the best front fours that you're going to see this season. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the defense before we move into the skull scale here. Uh, defensive side of the ball was um, they allowed 20 points, which uh, is a little above standard, I suppose. Carson Wentz actually played a pretty good game for the most part. Um, mm-hmm. But I thought that – I think Eric Kendricks has turned turned himself into – He's elite. He's elite. That it, that contract is an absolute steal. It, it, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, it's certainly starting to look that way. Um, he is solid in coverage. Uh, he's a good pass rusher. Um, he's outstanding from moving sideline to sideline. Uh, he very rarely misses tackles. Uh, Here's think- one example of a Kendrick's play that I want to talk about. So I think earlier, for maybe first half in the game, uh, there was like a third and three, third and four. Uh, and the Eagles ran this sort of quick screen to the to Alshon Jeffrey up top where he kind of came in motion behind and it essentially turned into like a bunch of trips uh, set out to the right. Uh, Wentz took the snap, threw it out there, and they had essentially two blockers to block two DBs out there. And then Jeffrey was kind of left alone to grab the first out. Uh, you know, maybe a quarter later, a few series later, I don't know what the case is, but it's another third and two, same situation. They're in the same exact set. And... Kendricks recognizes it where Jeffrey comes in motion. He kind of squirt, like he kind of edges his way over towards that side. Wentz throws the ball over there and he makes a tackle for the loss and they stop him on third and two. Like that's the kind of stuff that isn't really, you know, it's not in his athleticism. It's not in his, uh, you know, 
any of that. It's just all about the smarts and his ability to recognize things um, that I think is something that uh, he's really improved on and he's become a, really a stud at, you know, whether it's, you know, anticipating a guy leaking out to the flat, whether it's um, you see a guy, maybe he's uh, maybe his responsibilities are running back and he's staying in the block where then he'll charge in um, at the right time and, and get the, the sack on a blitz, whatever the case may be. He just, he know his instincts are phenomenal. Yeah, really the only guy that uh, that had Kendricks' number was the running back, Miles Sanders, strangely enough. Um, he had a, you know, uh, a, a much stronger performance than I think both of us anticipated, um, at least as a receiver. Uh, he was not much of a factor as a rusher. Yeah, those uh, those wheel routes seem to kind of be issues sometimes where I don't – I don't anytime think was... you get it. Anytime you get a running back where the running back is obviously the linebackers are playing downhill and the running back is going vertical, like you've just like just inherently yeah. your yeah your momentum is carrying you in different directions. It just puts you to at least one step behind, if not more. Uh, puts the linebacker in a bad spot. Uh, I think that's probably more props to Doug Peterson for that. Could be a, that's that probably matchup. a scheme thing. That's what it seemed like to me because uh, both of those throughout the longer plays he had the touchdown and then the, kind of the one down the left sideline. Mm-hmm. Were both, uh, you know, he was wide open on both of them, right. uh, and I think the second one was actually on or kind of past bar, but you couldn't really blame him for it either because it's it's not often you, anyway you, you see a running back kind of break up field. Uh, you kind of want to play the flats against those guys more importantly, but that that's that's a great play by Doug Peterson, I think. For sure. Um, other standouts here: Daniel Hunter gets another sack. Mm-hmm. He becomes the youngest player ever. Um, to record, I believe, what was it, 46 sacks now? Or something, yeah. Something like well, that? Well, yeah, he's the he's got the most sacks for anybody under 25. Right. I, mean, I think he's got a couple more games yet Yeah. Uh, before he's 25. So, so uh, quietest superstar uh, in at least yeah. Vikings history, maybe? Perhaps. Perhaps. I, mean, I know I did, if you look at the list of, the, of those guys with, you know, most sacks under 25, a lot of them flamed out pretty quickly. So yeah, we'll I see. saw that. It was Pull. Rob, Robert Pull. Quinn, Alden Smith. Yeah. Um, thank God, yeah. Uh, Daniil Hunter is not an Alden Smith uh, personality. Yeah. Um, so we'll see how his career plays out, but he's definitely on the trajectory for you know something special, obviously. Uh, Everson Griffin is still a stud. He's still making plays. He had the interception, by the way, from a kicker. Hilarious. Uh, kind of fun. <laughs> that was very uh, funny. It was Anthony Harris making a great play on that yes, ball, too. Yeah, Anthony Harris. Well, he kind of – he sort of took away the initial pass on the fake, which should have been a um, – no, I think that's what the Eagles were expecting was for that pass to be an easy one from the kicker. And it Anthony was not Hunter. an easy pass. <laughs> no, no, yeah. it was not. Um, Anthony Barr is still flying around everywhere. I think the only concern, I, I didn't see anything great from Rhodes. Um, you know, it seemed like Alshon Jeffrey kind of had his way for the most part, especially on kind of I short will take, stuff. I will take 10 catches for 76 yards, though. Yeah, because well, no. Jeffrey's not the type, at least anymore. I don't think that's going to beat you deep anyway. Like they don't, he's right. never running down the field on nine routes or, or deep posts or anything like that, uh, where he was maybe in his younger days with Chicago. But uh, I thought Trey Wayne's got away with a couple of penalties down the field on stuff uh, against Aguilar and uh, I think Mac Hollins maybe. He also got away with the one down the sideline where. Jeffrey caught it, and had he stayed in bounds, yes, that was a true. touchdown. But yep. at, at the same time, I think that Wayne's also had a couple of very nice plays as he well, did. which is kind of what we're like. That's kind of what Trey Wayne's is, right? Like he's been a guy who's been prone to getting burned um, every once in a while, but he also has the makeup speed and the ability to uh, make plays when it counts as well. Um, obviously, we, I everyone's just I mm, I want to know the numbers on that, like the number of penalties per deep shot down the field that like Waynes and Rhodes get because I feel like it's pretty high com- comparatively to other teams and I wonder if like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of coming up with this theory on the fly but like I wonder if teams look at say the deep passing stats that teams are getting against the Vikings secondary and they're obviously very good like the Vikings so it's the Vikings defense is performing good against deep passes let's say and then they're shying away from those chances but in reality a lot of those plays aren't being counted because it's penalties. Right. I wonder if that's like a, a perception that's being created because it seems like Waynes and Rhodes are often getting penalties on those deep shots. Maybe this is just me talking out of thin air and creating something that doesn't exist. I don't know, but then it's just a theory. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> I don't really have anything to add that. there. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Last guy, uh, Mackenzie Alexander gets his second career interception. He also gets half a sack, so a good all-around game from him as well coming off of injury. He seems to be back. Uh, cornerback depth appears to be back to um, good, mm-hmm. good, right, positive. So uh, far, yeah. Knock Mike, on wood. Mike Hughes was uh, – you didn't hear from Mike Hughes, right? Uh, he just – quietly went about his business when he was in the game um so that's, he had one really good pass breakup i believe on a fourth down actually where he was matched up with elshon and uh he kind of he essentially out muscled elshon which is pretty cool because mike hughes is not the biggest guy on the field and elshon is a very large person so that was kind of cool but that's a good point that's uh, the one remember that's the one memory i have of uh you know mike hughes in that game so that's kind of a positive one i think Certainly. Um, Vikings are probably four cornerbacks deep right now, even with uh, Rhodes scuffling a little bit. Um, Hopefully he obviously uh, can turn this around a little bit. Um, Biggest thing for the secondary, those cornerbacks, is just stay healthy. Like, because we've seen how quickly that can get thin. And let's keep in mind now, we're, what, two games from Holton Hill returning? Uh, if he's still going to be on the roster, we don't know how that is I can't, all going to play out. They wouldn't have but, kept him this long if he wasn't yeah, coming back. So, He'll be back, which he he seemed very serviceable last year when he would yeah. play. So uh, that's a nice uh, boost for them. But uh, I think we should give a game ball and then go into skull scale. I'm, I'm Let's down give it for that. Thoughts before that. I'm, that sounds like a perfect plan to me. Um, why don't you go ahead and give me your game ball? All right. Uh, I think there's going to be a couple popular choices here, but I'm going to go with Garrett Bradbury. Uh, it's not going to be the flashy choice by any means, but – an 85.8 PFF grade on pass blocking. I believe the first couple weeks of the year, he literally had zero, uh, 0.0 for his pass blocking grade. So clearly tremendous improvement there. And he did it against some stiff competition this week. Kept uh, Kirk clean for the most part. And I think Kirk had a clean pocket on like 70% of his drop back or something dumb like that, which is just a uh, much higher number than you know I'm used to looking at. So big props to Garrett Bradbury. He's coming around really nicely. That's a big game for him. Uh, and for me, I'll pick the easy one. Um, I dog Kirk Cousins whenever he plays poorly. Uh, I feel like it's only right for me to um, give him props uh, when he plays well. Uh, to me, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, to me, this was his best performance of his Vikings career. Um, coming into a game where this is kind of a swing game. We said this last week during the school sale segment. Um, if the Vikings could pull this one off. Uh, even if they had just gotten a win, uh, this was an emphatic win. Uh, but if they had just gotten a win, uh, this would bode well for Kirk. Uh, he comes out with an extremely just a, a pinpoint accuracy performance, uh, top to bottom. Uh, he did every, mm-hmm. he did basically everything right. Um, and I, I've, you know, I really wish that that Diggs play hadn't happened with the interception <laughs> because it just, it just gives people like Andrew Brandt a reason to dog Kirk when there really wasn't a, there wasn't a reason. There was no week. reason. There was no reason. There's nothing to find on him this week. He was outstanding. He gets my game ball for sure. So uh, from there, uh, let's take it into the skull scale. Okay. A couple of responses I want to highlight in the skull scale. Um, uh, do, you, do we, do, I can't, I think we're Do we usually give ours first or do we talk about the, the responses we get? I think we give ours first. Okay. I'll go with mine first. Uh, mine's going to be a very nice rating this week. Uh, feeling good about the Vikings in terms of, like, it's, if this is the offensive identity moving forward the last two weeks, I really like that this team, I think they can, they have a chance to beat, I think they can beat anybody at home in the first place, but I think they can, can compete with, you know, the Dallas Cowboys and the Kansas City Chiefs on the road and teams like that. Uh, I think that, you know, we've seen from Kirk in the past, he can get comfortable on the road, a la the Rams game last year, Packers game last year, uh, if they kind of let him fling it early on. Uh, but I think I'm jumping about a point here. 6.9 is my school score. That's why I'm saying it's a nice rating. 6.9. Uh, feel pretty good about the Vikings at home the rest of the year. I think they should be favored in all of them, and they should win about all of them. Uh, and they can grab a couple more on the road. They'll be set up nicely for a playoff spot, potentially potentially compete for the division. Again, I still like the Packers there, but 9-10 to 10 win seems very plausible at this point. Yeah, I mean, the the theory there is that you're supposed to win at home and play 500 on the road, which obviously would get you to 12-4. and four. Mm-hmm. So uh, Vikings are in a position to do that at this point. Um, I, I, said, I said last week that if the Vikings won this game, uh, that my skull scale would uh, – would skyrocket, and I stand by that, uh, especially after uh, what I would consider to be uh, 
a very d- decisive performance here. I, I saw a couple people, you know, annoyed with the fact that the Vikings let the Eagles back into the game for uh, a very brief moment. Yeah. I don't take – I don't put much stock in that. I mean, football is about ebbs and flows. It's going to happen. Uh, the Vikings responded when they need to and put this game away to the point where – uh, we saw Josh McCown in this game. So um, I'm, I'm going to jump all the way up to, I'll say, I'll say seven and a half. Uh, I'm about, I'm, 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 I think I'm actually above where I started for this season. And my reason being for that uh, is uh, I think that this team is complete. Uh, if you get this, like, it, there's nothing about this team. When Kirk plays like that or just to like like that um there's nothing about this team that there's no major flaw in this mm-hmm. team no um because the defense is still outstanding uh this defense is top five ish special teams is good too special teams right is now. really good Knock dan, dan bailey is a beast right now i mean you can't what is there to, what is there honestly to complain about right now kirk cousins, based on based on yesterday nothing nothing at all last two weeks kirk last cousins weeks. has been great uh, Dalvin Cook is a top five running back in the NFL this season, probably top three. Um, mm-hmm. Alexander Madison has been outstanding, by the way. Uh, so much better than I thought he was going to be. Uh, just a lot more relevant in general. Uh, the wide receivers are still elite. Um, top 15 seems... BC Johnson is also... You know, he's a reliable wide receiver three at this point. That sideline catch he had, uh, where kind of, I think Kirk had to improvise and roll out to his right. BC came back to him and a nice sliding catch. That's nice. That, that's the type of stuff that, you know, you're going to need uh, from your third receiver when things, you know, not are always open and Kirk's going to have to improvise and he move out of the pocket and he had the smarts to kind of come back to him, make himself available like that. You know, it's not necessarily going to be something that is taught or it's not going to be in the, you know, the game plan for the week, but he made it work. He, uh, he, I, I saw, saw him talk, uh, I can't remember where the interview was, but uh, he's the type of guy that got his head in the books right away. Uh, yeah, that's on, the uh, that was on the Under Center show with Kirk. There you uh, go. Okay. They asked him. They I think Kirk asked him like, "What was the biggest thing for you so far?" And he just said he night and day was studying the playbook when he wasn't actually at practice. And to me, and, that to me that's extremely important because the former wide receiver three clearly had some trouble picking up the scheme. Uh, mm-hmm. The fact that you have a guy who is just simply reliable in knowing what's going on, knowing the depths of routes to run, catching the ball when it's thrown to him. No drops so far for BC, by the way. Um, I mean, you'll take that all day long. Um, I, I can't. I, 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 I'm trying to think of a criticism. I can't find one. My biggest criticism is the screen passes to Kyle Rudolph. I've got nothing. <laughs> I've got nothing else right now. Uh, that's where I stand. The uh, biggest criticism is is now for me. Like showing up in big games, right? Yeah. Like in prime and time. There's games. nothing you can do about that, that right anything. now. No, there's not. There's not. There are five prime time games on the schedule the rest of the year. I think those five games are going to dictate the season, dictate the result that we are looking at week 17. Uh, and you know, at this point, I mean, I mean, whether we're going to really find out, if this is a mental block. Like if it's a franchise or if it's Kirk, whatever it is, but <laughs> like curse. a block. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if it's a curse or a mental block, whatever it is with these primetime games. But, you know, especially the week eight one against Washington. Like, if they flop in that one, Oof. then I think we, we know. But um, let's get to these responses here. <clears throat> um, we'll start with uh, a Bubka, Bubka, 2K5 on Twitter. Um, he says eight, which is optimistic, I would say. But at the same time, there's reason to be optimistic at this point. Garrett Bradbury had a really good game against a great defensive line. The whole all line really looked great, uh, which gave Cousins time to shred a bad secondary. If the all line can continue that kind of performance, the sky's the limit for this team. I completely agree with that. There's, yeah, there's no there's no holes in that statement. I mean, if the Vikings continue to win in the trenches, um, both sides of the ball, but primarily on offense, just to give uh, Kirk something to work with, um, there's uh, sky is the limit. Really, I mean. I said this earlier uh, in the conversation on Twitter. I mean, this is this Vikings team has they they could fluke their way into a postseason run. Still, um, this is there's no there's no dramatic holes on this team, except for Kirk Cousins is the only problem, and there's no problem right now. 
The volatility so, of Kirk Cousins is the is the, the problem there. That's clearly good. the clear glaring issue that's holding this team back, and or, and or propelling this team to win. It's like it's both at the same time. Right. Um. The other one here from our guy Kyle Slaby, uh, former pizza grunt, I believe. <laughs> Uh, what's his job title? Um, he's at a seven. So he's still suspicious of this offense against a good defense, but the bones of a good offense are being shown off. Uh, defense isn't the best that they've ever been. Uh, they're, I think, talking about the peak sometimes in 2017. Yeah. Uh, but more than great enough for a deep run, kind of like you were mentioning, this team definitely has the pieces to put together uh, one of those deep runs into the playoffs where they kind of get hot and if they can put it together at the right time they can be a dangerous one in the playoffs yeah um ultimately i think this is going to come down to coaching and like you said the volatility of Kirk cousins Mm -hmm. um because i think we're seeing this with san francisco especially right now like how great of an impact that that coaching can have breaking news eagles are releasing zach brown (laughs) 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 they're releasing zach brown did the, is that is that is there any statement or anything like that? that uh, along with I that? just got this report uh, notification on my phone from Bleacher Report. Eagles releasing linebacker Zach Brown. Multiple teams expected to be interested from Adam Schefter. So that's uh, Zach Brown. <laughs> that's, you that's are great. the weakest that link. Great. Goodbye. <laughs> um, Zach that's... Brown, the weakest link on his defense. Literally the he weakest was, link. He was he was the weakest <laughs> link yesterday too. That's all. Oh, that's so ironic. I love it. God, that and the the <laughs> nerve to not even talk about it after the game, too, you know, like as if he was like in the right to like, yeah, as if yeah, like he's he's expecting not to get those questions. I'm here to talk like about that. the game, and the reporter goes, uh, well, it seems like <laughs> the report the reporter's just like, uh, well, it seems like uh, that was kind of part of the game. He's like, I'm not talking. <laughs> he's like, gets all gruff about. It's like, oh my god, that's. Like, anybody that, have any other questions besides Kirk Cousins? The very next question. How do you think he played today? <laughs> <laughs> I think he played well. He's like, yeah, yeah, heads, heads off to him. Great. Yeah, good. All right, next. Thanks, Zach. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> I think that's probably – honestly, that's probably a good place to put a pin in this one because – Okay, I like uh, that. Zach Brown gets – he clowns <laughs> Cousins, his former teammate. Cousins lights him up. <laughs> he doesn't handle it well with the media, and he gets cut. That's That's – it's too good. That's fantastic. All right, folks. Uh, I'm well, so glad we got that notification just during the show. That's yeah, great. That's perfect. Um, yeah. Um, as always, folks, thanks for listening to the show. Um, if you haven't subscribed already on iTunes, uh, we'd appreciate if you do so. Um, same goes for YouTube. Um, as always, if you prefer to l- watch us talk instead of listen to us, uh, we are available on YouTube. We are every week. For the most part, uh, hit the subscribe button there. Like the videos. Um, what that does is it makes more people be able to see our stuff. So that is helpful, and we appreciate that. Um, later on this week, uh, we'll be back to preview the Vikings' impending matchup with the Detroit Lions. Uh, I think that the way that this show is going right now with the twin season being over a little bit earlier than I think uh, we would have hoped, uh, I think that this will be primarily a football show at least until the Wild either get their head, heads out of their asses or the Timberwolves uh, put something on display. So uh, you can expect more football. Um, hopefully you enjoy that. Uh, that's the game plan. So uh, thanks for listening, and we will catch you guys later on this week.